Okay, welcome to mechanical ventilation lecture. So the big thing, this is geared towards neonates. Uh, I have loaded on your blackboard a protocol or a policy on mechanical ventilation for uh, uh, kids and for babies. So you'll see that there. Uh, a lot of this lecture is going to assume pressure control as a primary mode out there, which pressure control is a primary mode. Uh, out there for uh, mechanical ventilation in most NICUs. Uh, volume ventilation is used, I'll talk about that a little bit, volume ventilation is used um, usually for kids that have more BPD, RDS, um, trying to help prevent that volume trauma of the transitional airways. And so when you're using volume ventilation on these kids, the reason uh, you have to be aware that if you're going to do it, you have to use a proximal flow sensor to the ET tube. You have to have that because if the ventilator, if it's measuring the volume through the circuit, expiratory circuit, and all the way back at the ventilator where it's measuring the volumes, because of Boyle's law, those volumes will vary dramatically from what was given in a neonate situation, right? even if it's SST'd in neonate. Now, once again, you should know your ventilator. Some vents, this may not be true, and I'm sure, I hope that's true in the future. But uh, currently, they don't consider anything that's not proximal airway sensor to have accurate volumes when you're working with this type of patient population, right? Adults, that's a whole separate thing. But in kids, you're talking about a tidal volume of six mLs per kilo, and this kid weighs 600 grams, so a little over half of a kilo. Uh, then you're looking at a tidal volume just over 3 mLs. And if your expiratory limb holds roughly, let's say, 7 to 10 milliliters into it, then because of Boyle's Law, there's less pressure as it goes further away from the patient towards the ventilator. So uh, less pressure equals more volume, so the exhaled volumes are going to look larger than what's actually going on at the patient. And therefore, if you keep decreasing the vent settings, you actually may hypoventilate this patient based upon the expiratory volume. So in short, if you're using volume ventilation with a neonate, a volume targeted ventilation currently as I make this lecture. Um, so some sort of PRVC, some sort of dual controlled volume targeted ventilation. Uh, if you're going to do it and then B, it has to have a proximal airway flow sensor to have accurate volume uh, readouts and delivery. Uh, for that baby. Uh, the other thing to make sure if you're using a dual controlled mode uh, like a PRVC uh, with these little guys that your delta P or the change of pressure is at least four centimeters water pressure or more. So what can happen just like with your COPD ears and with patients that are just working hard to breathe when you put them in dual control ventilation the ventilator says I'm going to use the least amount of pressure to deliver this tidal volume because it targets a tidal volume. And it says, I'm going to use the least amount of pressure to do so. Well, that sounds great. But the patient's working to breathe, really hard to breathe, then the ventilator is going to say, hey, I don't need to deliver it near as much pressure. I'll back off. Well, what's going to happen to these respiratory muscles? They'll eventually go into fatigue. Well, these muscles will go into fatigue, into an acidosis. Right, and so we're looking at something that may not be supporting the kid enough. If their their pressure support or if the change of pressure is four or less, so we want to make sure it's either four or more um, uh, when we're looking at a uh, dual controlled mode of ventilation with volume ventilation. Remember, volume ventilation you need a proximal airway sensor, and you need to make sure that your um, your dual control that you make sure that your delta P is also um, at least four, otherwise they're working too hard. So most of this will be pressure ventilation. Pressure is pretty universal uh, in NICUs. Um, and like I said, more volume ventilation is usually safe for those BPD, PIE, um, RDS type kids situations. And we'll talk more and more about this. All right, the goal of mechanical ventilation is ultimately to provide alveolar gas exchange with minimal damage to lung tissue. This is pretty hard uh, when we're talking about this because uh, we're having kids whose, especially most of the NICU babies are premature and their respiratory zone isn't quite developed yet, right? It's premature. It's not quite there. And so their surface area is very minimal. And what surface area they do have is very sensitive, very underdeveloped, very uh, 
very prone to tearing and damage, right? They don't have, have that developed uh, type 1 uh, pneumocyte yet. It's really, really just poorly sensitive, frail tissue. And so they're even more prone to injury. That's why you never, uh, as I make this video, uh, it's pretty poor, um, you pretty set in stone, where you pretty much almost never go above a pressure of 30, a total pressure of 30 for a neonate. Now remember in adults, you try to keep their plateau pressures under 30 centimeters of water pressure because plateau pressures roughly equating to alveolar pressure. Well, an alveolar pressure above 30 is equated to lung damage when you're looking at it. That's why the small tidal volumes are better because they have smaller uh, alveolar pressure, which keeps them from having barotrauma and or over distension volume trauma, right? So in adults, we don't want their peak pressures, right? Going above 40. In kids, just to be safe, we usually don't want their total pressure to go above 30, right? And so that's what we're looking at here. Um, and so we want to avoid as much alveolar damage as possible while still providing a pH balance, while still providing oxygenation and ventilation to the tissues that need it. So you're going to run into a situation here where it's very similar to someone with an emphysema on a ventilator, where you're going to be okay with a little bit of higher CO2 level. You're going to be okay with a little bit lower pH. Um, but the whole idea here is to protect the lung tissue as much as we possibly can. And the other thing here is to minimize uh, interface with circulatory systems. That means uh, their mean airway pressures, and that's something that we'll be looking at with the oxygen index equation as well. But the mean airway pressures is something we got to pay attention to, especially with their hemodynamics, right? Uh, because the thoracic cage can be expanded with positive pressure ventilation, that means that we might be squishing when the lungs are being inflated that might be squishing the vena cavas, which would then reduce preload to the heart, which would then reduce cardiac output, which would then cause a tachycardia, stress the heart out more, right? We're going to have all those issues. So that's something you just got to be prepared for and ready for, and that's why we have to alter our vent management in certain patients, especially with hemodynamic compromise. So let's all right, so all these different things here, let's get into what they're really looking at. PIP, usually, like I said, PIP in most um, circumstances, when the care team says, hey, I want a PIP of 20, they're meaning a total pressure of 20, right? So that means you need to know your ventilator. So if your ventilator, you set a PEEP and then you set a PIP, uh, you need to know if that PIP is the change of pressure or if that's the total pressure and then you would subtract your total from your PEEP to get your change of pressure, right? So you need to know your ventilator. What uh, does the ventilator manufacturer, the ventilator that you're working with, what does it do? Does it give you total pressure when you plug it in or does it give you change of pressure? Because when they give you a setting of 20 over five, uh, then you need to make sure that that's the total pressure is 20, not 25 over five, it's 20 over five, right? So that's something that we'll be talking about here. Remember, we try to keep pips and total pressures above, uh, below 30 if we can. And so that's something that we can really cause uh, damage with or hypoventilate if we don't have those right settings. Mean airway pressure we'll talk about more in detail. Uh, mean airway pressure is pretty important, especially when we're looking at ultimately transitioning to high frequency ventilation. And the, the one that I'm, I'm primarily will be talking about here would be the oscillator. And we'll talk about the jet too in this presentation, but the oscillator would be your big one here. Uh, the oscillator, when you switch someone over from the conventional ventilator to the oscillator, you're usually taking the same mean airway pressure from the conventional ventilation, and then you're plugging that into the oscillator, or you're doing three to five above the mean airway pressure on the oscillator. And we'll get a, into why that's so, but usually uh, that's a pretty easy one to explain when we get there. So that's something to pay attention to, especially when we're looking at the oxygen index equation. You need to be knowing what your maps are, right? And so the oxygen index equation is where we're looking at Oh, heavens. All right, we'll get into it in a second here. The oxygen index equation is where we're looking at um, uh, the how much oxygen is able to get from the ambulite into the bloodstream. So let's talk about PIP first. 
Uh, PIP, this sort of determines how much volume is getting into their lungs. So it's going to vary depending on their compliance because this is, we're assuming here, pressure control ventilation. So the bigger the PIP, the bigger the tidal volume. The smaller the PIP, the smaller the tidal volume. So let me give you a scenario. So you're at a delivery and you have the kid and you put them on a ventilator at a delivery and we usually call those neopuffs there's little baby ventilators that are in um, that sometimes are incorporated into the open warmer and you set the kid on 20 over 5. how do you know that you have the right setting well there you may not be able to know you're not going to have the ability to run a gas right there right now uh, in a lot of certain situations but one of the things that you're going to look at is the chest wall moving have we achieved opening pressure? Are we actually ventilating this kid? And so I know it's very subjective, but in a, in a crash situation like this, you might have to be able that you're seeing that good chest expansion. Now, before you start increasing pressures until you see good chest expansion, if they're on the ventilator, right, make sure they're still intubated. That's one of the key things. This is your dope mnemonic, dislodgement, obstruction, pneumothorax equipment right so make sure that that's all going well if they're not intubated this is where you do your mr sopa or miss opa from nrp right so this is not till you hit to the p part of mr sopa or miss opa uh not till you hit that p part do you increase pressure you got to make sure their head's positioned right their suction so on and so forth so this is everything that you're looking at here so if you see chest expansions start to diminish it could be something like a plug it could be something uh, like they were accidentally extubated, which can happen it's very easily in this patient population. So use your clinical judgment here, right? Use your end title, use, right? Use your judgment here. Instead of just going and ramping up the pressure to start off with, just because you don't see good chest expansion, that might be a very poor move when all they needed was a suction or their ET tube had come out. And so now we just need to reintubate them, right? So initially you're going to set their, ch their, set it for chest expansion and then we're still going to make sure it's safe we're not going to set it for 45 over 5 right so we're going to make sure that we get just enough to sort of see some chest expansion and then we'll get uh, an abg uh, as soon as we can so chest expansion usually around 16 to 20 uh, for your total pressure um, should be enough now the more premature they are the higher the pip you might need so that's what it says here Poor lung compliance equals increased PIP for chest expansion. Because they're premature, because their respiratory zone is so underdeveloped, it's going to take a lot more pressure to open up what lung tissue they do have because the tissue, remember, is closer together. And that's Laplace's law, right? The tissue is closer together. It's more likely to collapse. That surface tension is higher. And so because of Laplace's law, they're going to require a higher PIP uh, initially just to overcome that critical opening pressure. So we might have to go higher. We might have to go 25 over 5. We might have to go 28 over 5, especially for those premature because their lung compliance can be very, very poor because their surface area is low to begin with. Good lung compliance, this happens closer and closer to term, hopefully. Uh, this means we don't need nearly as much PIP to get their chest to move in and out. This is a good thing. That means uh, we're doing okay here. And so understand, especially if you give a kid surfactant replacement therapy, do you need that same 28 over 5 that you were using beforehand? I would hope not, and I would hope that you're titrating um, especially after you do a therapeutic procedure like surfactant replacement therapy to make sure that we have the right amount of pressure going into that kid's lungs because if we leave them on that same 28 over 5 when they had very very poor lung compliance uh, then we could easily now be causing a ventilator induced lung injury we could be causing barotrauma right talk about pressure there it is. Um, so this is something that we have to be very sensitive to. Now, if this kid was in volume ventilation, would we have to worry about changing their tidal volumes? 
Absolutely not, right? Because we're going to give them a volume protective target, right? We're going to give them a 6 ml per kilo tidal volume. We're going to give them a lung protective tidal volume to begin with, so we won't have to worry about titrating settings besides oxygenation settings afterwards. So pay attention to your mode. If this kid's in volume targeted ventilation and it's a safe tidal volume, then we don't have to change that. Their mean airway pressure may be reduced, which is great, but we have to be aware that um, if they're in pressure targeted ventilation or pressure controlled ventilation, or as the NBRC calls it, the time cycle, or yeah, pressure regulated time cycle and all that business. But we gotta be aware of what's going on with our intervention and if we need to take uh, action afterwards to avoid lung injury. Like I said, most of the time when they say, I want a PIP of this, they, they're not talking about a pressure support or delta P. They're talking about total pressure. Mean airway pressure. So this is mean airway pressure, not mean arterial pressure when we're talking about it here. Uh, so mean airway pressure. And here's the fun equation down here. Enjoy that one. I won't make you guys calculate that one, but there it is for your complete knowledge in the program. The average amount of pressure that's in the airway from the beginning of inhalation to the next inhalation, uh, usually calculated by the ventilator. Uh, know that some ventilators have a little bit different calculations. Some of them will do it from breath to breath. Others will do it over the course of a minute. So just be aware of that. So if you are switching a kid from conventional to an oscillator where you're using the map setting for, or the maps that they had from conventional to put that setting into the oscillator, make sure you just stare at the vent for a little while. <laughs> make sure you know it's if it's either a breath to breath or you know if it's a uh, over the course of a minute and it changes, right? So be aware of that. Um, so know your ventilator. So usually calculated by the ventilator, it should give you in one of the screens. Uh, must carefully monitor, it's a powerful influence over oxygenation. So the oxygen index, so the oxygen index is map times FiO2 over PaO2. All right, and so this is times 100. All right, off to the side, which usually just means put your decimal over two spaces. So what we're looking at here is with the oxygen index equation, instead of looking at lung compliance, because here's the thing with lung compliance in these neonates is if we have a kid, and according to Hooke's law, if we start to reach over distension, their compliance will decrease. If we under distend them, if we have more atelectasis, if we're not using enough mean airway pressure, then their compliance will also be low because of shearing trauma and Laplace's law. So Hooke's law if it's high, Laplace's law if it's low, so the lung compliance will be low in both over distension and under distension. So instead of looking at lung compliance to sort of see how healthy or sick the lungs are, I can use something like this to see how well my diffusion is across my alveolar capillary membrane. So I'm looking at the mean airway pressure or how much pressure is pushing into the alveoli. And then I'm also looking at the concentration of oxygen. So here, if you want to imagine this dividing line, the numerator, denominator, right? As the alveolar capillary membrane and your PaO2 is the vessel right there, you're trying to see how well oxygen gets from up here into here, right? And so that's what you're looking at. How well is their diffusion? So it's almost like a weird way of looking at a DLCO. Uh, how easy or hard is it to get from in the lungs, in the alveoli, to into their bloodstream? The higher the value, the more likely they are to have a lot of issues, right? So if they hit a value of 30, uh, 30 to 40, that's where we're looking at things like ECMO and high frequency if we haven't started it already and um, nitric and all these other things that we would be looking at. So the higher the number, the worse off this patient is. And so the oxygen index is something that we use. And one of the primary things we have to look at, mean airway pressure. The more pressure, more FI2 it takes and if we're hardly getting any return, that sort of look, it's a different way of looking at a PF ratio like we, we talk about with adult ARDS patients, right? Because it, uh, it, the PF ratio, 
um, you're looking at how easy it is to pretty much get across the membrane, right? PO2 to FiO2. This is sort of a different way of looking at it, but it's factoring in the pressure, the barometric, well, not barometric pressure, but the pressure the ventilator is using. And so this is one of the things we look at oxygenation. So if a baby's on conventional ventilation, they're requiring a lot of mean airway pressure. Uh, that might be something that we might have to switch them over, like a machine that has more control and more and less barotrauma associated with it, which would be like high frequency with an oscillator. The advantage of that, the oscillator, is we can run a, a same or higher mean airway pressure and have tidal volumes smaller than the anatomical dead space and have less chance at volume trauma or atelect trauma. It's pretty cool. Indications, we'll talk about this, Hyper, hypoxemic, hypercapnic, or both can be the issue. Hypoxemia, if they're on a lot of FiO2, and 50% for a neonate is a lot of oxygen. And so usually when we're hitting the 40% range, we're looking at the x-rays, we're trying to see if they need surfactant, we're trying to see if they're left shifted on their, their um, white blood cells, right? So we're, we're looking at a number of different things here. So if this is a high, this is a high concentration for them. So if they're on that and their PO2 is still pretty small, that might be a sign they're in hypoxic and they might meet, need more pressure than just the CPAP alone is providing them. So if their SAT's less than 90, uh, this is one of the things that we might look at. Uh, are they hypocapnic? Do they have less than 30 millimeters of mercury? And that's something where that would be an indication of the CO2 disassociation curve and how their body is using that oxygen. So. That would also be a left shift if they're in an alkalosis, which is a left shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Um, that would be a pH over 7.50. And it's bad, right? Because when you have a left shift, the hemoglobin gets loaded on with oxygen and your PaO2 is very, very tiny. And you need the PaO2 to start the cascade to get the oxygen off of the hemoglobin into the tissue. So if your PO2 is low, no matter what your saturation is, you're not going to have good oxygen delivery into your tissue. So your brain, your heart, your kidneys, you name it, is going to have poor oxygen delivery. Then you go into metabolic um, issues as well, um, a hypoxic, uh, a hypoxic and an anaerobic uh, metabolism will start in there. Uh, so if they have too high minute ventilation, things like that. If they're hypercarbic or hypercapnic, uh, this would be a, a CO2 over 50, or uh, if we're looking at the pH less than 7.25, uh, that's a sign they meet, meet acidotic failure. Uh, remember, you have your type 1, type 2 failures. That's what we're looking at here. And or both of them could be very bad, and we just have a bad pH. Ultimately, uh, because we're hypoxic and hypercarbic, then both of them would cause the pH to be, can cause the pH to be very, very low. So those are breaking points. If I give you a question down the road and you see this and they're not intubated, guess what it's an indication for, right? That's what we're going to look at. Now, be aware of this number here, the 50, the CO2 of over 50. Uh, some of these patients, especially the BPDers, uh, RDSers, we might run very similar to the, the permissive hypercarbia patients that you see in the adult world in ARDS. So we'll be okay with a PA, uh, PA CO2 of 50 to 55 as long as their pH is above 7.25, just to help protect lung tissue and not destroy tissue and make their blood gas look pretty, but we want their long-term outcome to look good. So very similar to those, those patients in the adult ICU where we let them be a little bit more hypercarbic to prevent lung damage, that's the same theory here. So you got that when you're looking at it. Uh, cause of respiratory failure, there's a bunch of different things, neurological altercations, especially um, apnea prematurity, injuries, uh, you name it, impaired respiratory function, especially with neural injuries and things like that, um, blockages, anatomical um, alterations, impaired cardiac function, especially with congenital heart defects, and then even post-operative, especially with medications and things like that. So there's a lot of different things that can cause this, and your book goes into way more detail than I'm willing to go into here because this lecture will already be long. Hazards of mechanical ventilation, the general hazards, of course, edema, hemodynamics, um, oxidative injury, which is that next part. Uh, we talked about in one of, in the disease lecture, oxidative lung injury.
because these kids are way more prone to oxidative injury. Unlike adults, they, these kids haven't developed a resistance to the oxidative injury as much. And so that's one of the big things we have to look at, especially for prematures, because we're looking at retinopathy for, with prolonged high FiO2s as well as um, O3 and having free radicals in their system and causing a lot of shutdowns and also reducing surfactant production. Remember, high FiO2s reduce surfactant production and high FiO2s also reduce the mucociliary escalator for airway clearance. So these kids are also prone at more at risk for a pneumonia and things like that. So oxygen, we try to titrate them down as soon as possible. This is a very serious drug up in the neonates uh, world. And so if we can get them to room air, we, we will, right? And you will have patients that you take care of up there that are on room air on the ventilator. And that's okay. With, the lower we can get that, uh, the closer we can get to room air and then be within their SAT range and their PO2 range, the better, right? For the more premature kids. Now the more term kids, we're okay with a little bit higher saturation, a little less likely to have oxidative injury. Uh, that's a whole separate situation, especially if we think a kid might have pulmonary hypertension and we don't have the ability to give like nitrate or anything like that. That actually might be a therapeutic intervention for a kid that might have premature pulmonary hypertension or sorry, primary pulmonary hypertension of the neon, right? So hazards of PIP, of course, uh, this is going to be barotrauma, uh, too much PIP, too much mean airway pressure could easily cause barotrauma. Uh, it also can cause uh, volume traumas, right? So if we're talking about tidal volume here, that's something that we have to pay attention to because that could cause way too much there. So let's say you have a situation where you have a, a patient on a, a total pressure of 30 over 5, and the doctor says, well, they're hypercapnic and their pH is less than 725, so I want you to somehow increase their minute ventilation, but I don't want you to go up on your pressure. Well, if you go down on your PEEP, does that that can cause adelect trauma. So one of the options you have in time cycled ventilation and pressure control ventilation is you can increase your eye time. If I increase the eye time, I have a longer time at this 30 centimeters of water pressure, which means I'll have a longer breath delivery, which means my tidal volume in theory gets a little bit bigger, but I keep that total pressure low. Does that make sense? So a way to adjust your your tidal volume in pressure control ventilation, if you do want to keep the same mean airway pressure or uh, keep the same PIP, sorry, would be to change your eye time up or change your eye time down. Understand when you do change your eye time, it will change your mean airway pressure up or down. But uh, if you if they don't want to change the PIP or PEEP setting and they want to bigger tidal volume breath or more CO2, then eye time would be where you would go. The respiratory rate, these kids breathe so fast and go over it unless they're paralyzed that uh, that's usually not the first option on the board for a lot of these things. Uh, so hazards of PIP, barotrauma, volume trauma. Uh, hazards of PEEP, of course, hemodynamics is going to be one of the big ones that we'll be looking at here, right? Uh, especially if there's too much PEEP going on, you can cause that uh, compression on the pulmonary capillaries as well, and cause a dead space issue, as well as too much pr thoracic pressure and cause an issue on your vena cava, as well as too much thoracic pressure and back pressuring the superior vena cava, which back pressures the jugulars, which goes to the brain, right? And that's when we're looking at higher uh, issues with uh, with PIPs, mean airway pressures, higher pressures altogether on a mechanical ventilator for a neonate can ultimately lead to an issue with, uh, or potential issue with intraventricular hemorrhage or a brain bleed. So we got to be very cautious of this. So this is a picture of an ARDS model. I know, an adult ARDS model, but this is sort of a very similar pathology in some ways. It's not exact, but similar pathologies, not the same etiologies by any means, but <laughs> how many adults do you see with premature? Anyway, so when we're looking at this, you see all this cellular debris, all this pus, for lack of a better term, that gets created and finds its way into the respiratory zone. Well, this causes the AC membrane 
to then become very, very, very thick, right? Now we have a very thick AC membrane. And then our diffusion, our oxygen index, uh, gets worse because now we have hyaline membrane or scar tissue start to form. That's why they used to call RDS hyaline membrane disease, HMD, right? Because we're forming scar tissue, right? So all this scar tissue is forming. Not only that, but all we have all this cellular uh, pus start to develop into their alveoli as well. So not only is their compliance really poor, their ability to diffuse is also really poor, and as well as to move the the respiratory zone altogether. So if you're pushing a tidal volume into this patient's lung, you have your conducting airways, which are like your trachea, your main stem bronchi. Those things are all covered with cartilage, right? They have cartilaginous uh, structure to them, like an exoskeleton, right? Then you get down to your transitional airways, which have no cartilage in them. And then you have your respiratory zone, which also has no cartilage in them. So let me ask you this. What's the most compliant part of this RDS baby? What's the most compliant part of their lungs? So if you were to deliver a breath, which part will expand? Will it be the sick alveoli? Absolutely not. It's got all this stuff restricting expansion. Will the conducting airways, the trachea, the main stem bronchi, the subsegmental bronchi, will those expand? No, they have that exoskeleton. They have that cartilaginous structure. So the area that expands is this area up here, this transition zone. And if you guys remember my pulmonary AMP class, that transition zone has no cartilage, and therefore most of the damage that can get uh, that can happen with these RDS babies is this area up here, this transition airway, can easily expand to the point where it starts having holes that develop and we have all these air leak syndromes and PIE can be one of the things that we look at here. And that's something we got to be very cognizant of. So if you keep on increasing pressure on a baby that has very poor compliance and a very sick lung, you're looking at destroying something like this, like their transitional airways. Then their airways become very floppy like your emphysematic patients where they lose a lot of the structure and they'll have premature collapse and more issues later on. So you've got to be cognizant. Pressure control ventilation brings with it a lot of detailed stuff. You may think it's easy initially, but no, underneath, if you don't know what you're doing, if you're not watching it, hey, at one minute, they're looking great. They're, they're oxygenating really well at five minutes. Look, their x-ray is looking better. And then you keep that pressure on there. The compliance is really good here. But now you've gotten to the point where they now no longer require as much pressure. You recruited their tissue, but instead of decreasing it, to an appropriate level, you kept going, right? And then that's when we're starting to see things like barotrauma or volutrauma. So I think it was Children's Hospital of Colorado um, did, um, did a study where they put lungs in a cast and they put lots of pressure in there to simulate barotrauma. And then they let other lungs next to it expand um, to simulate volutrauma. And they took uh, histology samples uh, and then they looked at hyaline membrane formation was most associated with volutrauma or overexpansion. And so that's why in those kids that are more RDS uh, and BPD years and so on and so forth, uh, you're looking at looking at volume targeted ventilation to reduce that overexpansion um, to control that. Uh, so that's something that you might have to look at because if we just leave them in pressure control and we don't know what's going on with our patient. Hey, you might come in and be like, oh, their compliance is getting worse. Let's increase their pressure. Well, their compliance might be getting worse because now their lungs are more compliant or more stretchy to the point of Hooke's law where they're, it's like a balloon that's about ready to burst, right? If you blow up a balloon and you the first couple breaths, super hard. The balloon is blowing up easier and you're about ready to blow the balloon to the point where it pops what happens to how hard it is to blow in it makes it really hard to blow in so when you look at poor lung compliance it could either be from over distension or from under distension so that's why you need to be very very careful that's why volume ventilation in this situation would still be protective because we're not doing too much volume we're not doing too little volume so that's something to be considering of when you have these neonates that are going into more of an RDS BPD.
Lung compliance. Uh, that's what we were just talking about, lung compliance. We have a known pressure, and so we can look at moving pressure or dynamic compliance versus static compliance. Normal compliance on a neonate. Do you see this? Do you not see this, right? <laughs> two, two and a half to five mLs per centimeter of water. So on an adult non-intubated patient, normally you should be roughly about 80 to 100 milliliters per centimeter of water pressure. And let's just say a vented patient, let's say a normal for a vented patient is somewhere between 50 to 60 milliliters per centimeter of water pressure, right? We'll cut that in half just for namesake for this conversation. Then when we look at a neonate, what do you notice? extremely small or extremely low compliance. So their lungs are very stiff. And so when we're looking at this, they have very stiff lungs. And so this means the most compliant part of their airway is not their respiratory zone. It's not their primary or their conducting airways. It's their transition zone. So we need to be very gentle. By pushing more pressure into their lungs, you may not actually recruit alveoli. You might just be pushing open and distending the transition zone, right? So in this case, doing a lung recruitment maneuver, pushing tons of mean airway pressure in there may not actually recruit sick alveoli. It actually may cause more damage. So we got to be very careful um, with these kids, right? What, what was the goal when we started out with? We got to prevent lung damage with these little guys. They don't have much lung tissue to begin with in the premature situation, right? So the determinants of compliance are going to be the alveolar surface forces, so that's the good old Laplace's law and Hooke's law, and then how elastic the tissue is. Remember, the elastins will increase as their lungs get sicker. So as we go into more of an RDS, it'll increase elasticity, which will then increase surface tension forces as well. Or surface tension forces will be increased as surfactant is deficient, right? So the more premature kid is, the more surface forces or Laplace's law takes effect because they don't have that surfactant to reduce or to neutralize Laplace's law. <laughs> so resistance or raw of the baby. Very, very high. Notice the normal down here for these babies. 20 to 30 centimeters of water per liter per second. Huge. So on a spontaneously breathing adult, a normal is 0 0.5 to 1.5 centimeters of water per liter per second, right? As you get onto a ventilator, the raw can increase because now you're breathing through a straw. And so now we're looking at a raw between, let's just say, five to seven centimeters of water per liter per second. Well, look at the raw here. And what do you notice, right? This is this is Posey's law, right? You got a bigger tube and a smaller, more narrow tube, right? The more narrow the tube is, the more when gas flows through a big tube, it's going to be pretty laminar. It has less forces bouncing off the walls. When you have gas flowing through a narrow tube, it's going to bounce all over the place and therefore take a lot longer to get into the lungs. So the raw is going to be increased because of their anatomy as well. Not only that, if they're spontaneously breathing, where does a baby breathe spontaneously mostly for the first four to six months of their life, right? They're going to be obligate nose breathers because their mouth is for suck swallow their nose is for breathing so what happens to your raw is you're breathing through the tiny nares versus your whole oral pharynx right so that's Posey's law coming into effect again so the change of pressure will also factor this so this means whenever you're ventilating this patient if they say hey this patient's on uh, 20 over 5 right I know it looks like a 3 so 20 over 5, and they want you to change it to, let's say, 25 over 5. So they just want you to go up on the total pressure by 5 centimeters of water. What happens with their raw? Right, the raw increases. That means their time constant increases as well. It's going to take a lot longer for gas to get through here than it does through this big, wide, open container, right? It, going to bounce all off the walls. It's going to be more chaotic and less transitional, right? So this would be more transitional gas flow. This would be your chaotic, right, your turbulent flow. So when you're doing, when you're increasing settings, when you're increasing delta P, remember this law does not go away. It's a gas law, right, or it's a law altogether when we're looking at this. So 
we're going to have an increase in the air resistance, which is going to increase their time constant, which could then lead to things like air trapping and a higher risk of a pneumothorax. So that's something you've got to be cognizant of with this. Radius of the tube, of course, we already talked about the larger size. The length of the tube. The length of the tube is something that we have to look at as well. The length of the tube uh, is something that we usually make sure it's at least four centimeters of water from the end of their ET tube or less. Um, or sorry, uh, as long as the tube position's good on x-ray, then we'll trim the ET tube um, to have at least a little bit sticking out. If we keep a very, very long ET tube, and remember baby ET tubes are very, very tiny and fragile, and so if we hook a whole vent circuit up to this, this ET tube here, we're going to have an issue where if it's, the circuit's there, it could easily weigh down and actually kink off the ET tube. So there's a reason why we, we trim these tubes and get rid of dead space as much as possible. So the length of the tube can factor into this. So we do trim their tubes. That can be part of uh, changing their raw as well. Uh, the viscosity of gas, so this is uh, not something that we play with heliox in a neonate, something that's rarely done, so that's not something we'll talk about here, but that is all in Posey's law, right? Time constants, hopefully you guys all remember this. This is where you take your lung compliance in liters times your airway resistance, your raw. So you're taking compliance times raw, and that equals one time constant. So that tells me how long it takes to give a tidal volume and how long it takes for that tidal volume to be exhaled. Now, if we're looking at um, four or five time constants, five would be closer to 100% of the tidal volume. We're not talking total lung capacity. In and total lung capacity out, we're talking tidal volume in and tidal volume out, so 10%, right? And so when we're looking at this, we know that a time, one time constant, 63% of their tidal volume will either be delivered, or if we're looking at it a different way, 63% of their tidal volume will be exhaled. You're like, why do I need to know this? Well, let me get into this. If I give a baby and I make sure that their eye time, their inspiratory time, or their expiratory time is at least three time constants or more, so we're looking at three, four, or five time constants, then I know I reduce the chance for auto peep. I reduce the chance for air trapping. I reduce those things because the tidal volume has then been fully delivered and fully exhaled. So there's less chance of CO2 retention and less and, and better ventilation as well as less chance of an issue with a pneumothorax or barotrauma, right? You're like, okay, that's a pretty neat trick. So I take their compliance times raw, and then I take that value, because that's at one time constant. I take that value times three or times four, and I make sure that my I time is at least that. There you go. So in the adult world, this also comes into play. Let's say you're running a mode of ventilation called APRV, right? And let's say you're running it with zero peep. That's all right, so this is your pressure scalar, right? And so if you're running zero peep, on these patients, you cannot make sure you have to make sure that they air trap. You have to make sure that they auto peep on purpose if you're running a peep of zero on these APRV, the zero peep method, right? So if you're running the zero peep method here, you need to do your time constant. You could look at your flow waveform, and this gets subjected with the flow waveform, where you make sure it's 50 to 75% uh, auto peeped on their flow waveform, right? So you want to make sure that the next breath is delivered before that flow returns back to baseline. So that's your auto peep section there. So there's one way of doing it. It's very subjective. Uh, and you would want to make sure it's at least 50 to 75% uh, there. So this would be too little. Or you can actually do the math and know exactly how much you're going to auto peep. So if I do, um, do this and I say I take this times two, then I know that that's where I set my expiratory time on APRV, right? And so I can change it, and therefore I take out the subjectivity of this whole flow waveform issue. So something to look at. So 
time constants in general is saying how long it takes for you to deliver breath and how long it takes for you to exhale. So there's two factors into here, right? Compliance and raw. So let's do the first one. So compliance, if I have a smaller container, right? So we'll assume this is a little shot glass here. <laughs> very, very small container. Does it take a long time to fill up this container? It does not. It's a short time constant. So if you have low lung compliance, it's like a shot glass. It's not going to take long to fill it up, and it's not going to take long for it to empty. Right? So if you have a short time constant, assuming your airway resistance was fine, then your issue is your compliance is low. If I make this container really big we got like the giant big gulp cup over here we have a lot more container to fill this means it's going to take a lot longer to fill up a lot longer to deliver that tidal volume and it's going to take a lot longer for this to empty a lot longer for them to exhale right so that's looking at compliance so a big healthy Normal compliance is going to be a long time constant. Uh, very sick, restricted, RDS type compliance, short time constant. All right, the other factor is error resistance. So we have a baby over here with a 2.0 ET tube. So with a 2.0 ET tube, it's very, very small, and it's going to cause a lot of issues with right airway resistance because of turbulent flow so now we upgrade them to a 2.5 et tube right 2.5 et tube and when this happens we have a little bit of a change to more transition flow it still has some bouncing that goes off but it's not near as much so when this happens we're going to have a lot better chance at a different time constant so this one over here with the larger 2.5 et tube on the right it's going to have a lot shorter time to get in and a lot shorter time to get up because it spends less time bouncing off the walls and getting distracted, right? Bouncing laterally and all over the place. So big open airway, short time constant, right? It's like having a giant hose. Is it going to take a long time for that water to flow through there? Absolutely not because it has uh, no pressure that's sort of back pressuring it and keeping it from coming out at a normal speed. So when you're looking at that, you're going to have a short time constant with a larger hose and a long time constant with a smaller hose. So let's say a baby's having bronchospasm or an adult's having bronchospasm uh, or laryngeal spasm, you name it. What's going to happen to their time constant? Well, it'll increase, right? Because it's going to take a lot longer for that chaotic flow to get delivered and a lot longer for that chaotic flow to get back out. So that's what we're looking at here with time constants. So it comes into place, neonate through adult, so it does not go away, so get used to it. So three time constants are less, you're looking at auto peeping. Um, three time constants are more, you're looking at more 100%, closer to 100% of tidal volume delivery and or tidal volume exhaling, so better ventilation that way. So time constants, important. I think they're important, I never knew what they were. Uh, until I started using it uh, <laughs> more and more in clinical practice. Modes of ventilation, volume control. Uh, you, it's very rare we're actually using volume control here. Usually we're using volume targeted ventilation, which in theory, if you go into it, is more of a pressure control. Uh, but when we're doing volume targeted ventilation or dual control ventilation, we can either use it in um, SIMV or in assist control or continuous, right? So when you're looking at this, most of your neonates will be in some version of SIMV. And a lot of times they just call it IMV in the NICU. So the S stood for synchronization. And so when you're looking at this, since their normal neonate respiratory rate is anywhere between 30 and 60, super fast. And the synchronization was meant to see, okay, you have the breath, and then, oh, they just took a spontaneous breath. Okay, that's fine. I just gave them pressure supported breath. And then now the breath has been delivered. Okay. And then now they trigger a breath over here. And it was about to be when another assist, uh, another timed breath was going to be. So they triggered. And now it's going to give her that synchronized. It synchronized that spontaneous trigger 
over here with an assisted breath. Well, in the kid, they're breathing so fast that that synchronization part really is not as um, used as much because, um, because of how fast that they're breathing. So usually they'll call it IMV. They mean SIMV. Uh, as far as the vent mode goes, you're using the SIMV mode, even though the S part really isn't being utilized here. Um, so uh, SIMV or CMV assist control. There's a debate about there. They might be moving more towards assist control. Um, that's a whole separate thing that we can talk about later. But because they breathe so fast, there is the worry about air stacking, right? And so that's the advantage of SIMV is it can help avoid air stacking, right? Breath stacking. Because those little spontaneous breaths, uh, that means they're short, they're um, a sine wave pattern, they're usually going to be less likely to cause that back pressuring of the lung tissue. And so that's why SIMV for the small, quick, spontaneous baby breaths in, in the middle of a tachypnea or even a normal respiratory rate, less likely to build up higher mean airway pressure, less likely to cause thoracic issues, chemodynamic issues, uh, brain bleed issues, like the less issues we have there. However, the disadvantage here is uh, we have, in the adult world, in the, the late 80s or the 90s, a lot of studies were coming out with SIMV that the patients were spending longer on the ventilator because these patients could not sort of synchronize themselves to what the ventilator was doing. It was actually confusing their brainstem, their, their pons, their pneumotaxic centers. Uh, to where they their respiratory drive was irregular and they couldn't get them weaned off the ventilator at the same. I don't know how valid that is or how well those studies were done, but you're still looking at the possibility of going to assist control or a continuous mode where all the breaths are um, are the same volume or the same pressure. It's the SIMV where you get both spontaneous and assisted breath. So uh, most of the time you'll see IMV out there with these because they breathe so fast. Pressure control, uh, same thing here. You'll either have an assisted or IMV. Um, you could have uh, just a straight CPAP here, no pressure support. More of a wean, but usually what we'll do is we'll put them in SIMV. Right, we'll put them in SIMV, and then once we get them down to like a respiratory rate of 10 or less, we'll draw a gas, we'll look at their x rays, we'll do a whole thing. Is this baby ready to be extubated? Because at a rate of 10, it's very minimal because they're doing most of the work themselves. So it's to the point where it's just CPAP and pressure support, and then that those 10 breaths a minute are more for retina, uh, for um, apnea prematurity. And so at that point, that's when they would start to consider uh, extubation to CPAP or to RAM cannula or to something like that. Uh, what do we use most common in the neonate? Pressure control, like I said, uh, pressure control, especially if we don't have proximal airway flow sensors, there's still hospitals out there, even level three NICUs that don't have proximal airway sensors. And so that's something that uh, you would be then using pressure control for these little babies, right? Uh, so time cycle, pressure limited, the inspiration stops when we hit the eye time. Maximum pressure is selected, but and not exceeded, that would be your PIP, like I talked about earlier. So let me ask you, oh, there's way more brands of vents. This is a very old slide, I'll have to up, update this, right? So now we have the, the 980, right? We have the draggers, there's the servo used now. Oh yeah, there's a lot more different types of brands of vents out there. A lot of the adult ICU vents that are out there, the Hamiltons, oh, that's not even on here, I can't believe that. Um, there's so much more vents out there that do neonate through adult now. It used to be you had these little baby birds, that's what they were called, you can Google image that. Um, you used to have all these different types of baby ventilators out there. The Infant Star, which we have in our lab, in the back of the classroom. Uh, so there's all these other vents that were just neonate only. So now we have adult vents that can do neonate through adult, which is kind of cool. Um, so that way our vent fleet is uh, uniform, at least as much as it can be. Um, so when we're looking at these vents, uh, some of them come with proximal flow sensors like the the um, Hamiltons, especially. I, all of them come with a proximal flow sensor. So you don't have to worry about that with volume ventilation versus pressure. But if you're looking at something like the, the 
PB840, at least, did not come with a proximal flow sensor. Um, so you do need to know what vent you're using and what its capabilities are for any units. So if you do not know, use pressure control. <laughs> Hopefully you know, especially if you're working in that area. Picture of an old 840, <laughs> traditional 840. Be kind to this. This was the modern stuff when I started. Oh, the dragger. So this is one of the vents I used when I started. Um, here you actually have to set a flow. It had volume guarantee on it. It did have a proximal flow sensor. Uh, the, the advantage of this guy was, and look at those waveforms, amazing. The advantage of this guy, uh, there was a lot of advantages to this guy. It doesn't look nearly as fancy as the 840 does, but uh, smaller size, uh, looks a lot less intimidating to family as well. Even though it's a smaller size, it, it looks like it's a lot less going on and a lot less complication. So I liked the aesthetics uh, of a smaller looking ventilator next to the bedside as far as that goes, but uh, there's a bunch of different ones out there. Of course, these are all older pictures, but enjoy some respiratory history. All right, CPAP. All right, you guys all know what CPAP stands for. The big thing is we're gonna give uh, positive pressure and increase FRC and hopefully decrease the work of breathing on these patients. So that's something that we're going to do. If a baby is working hard to breathe, they might do a, like a ram cannula where we can give a pressure support, like baby BiPAP, so to speak. But uh, a lot of times, if, if they're working hard, they might just need, they have that Laplace's law going on where their airways are collapsed, especially if their x-ray shows GGOs. They have ground glass opacities or atelectasis or poor expansion on their x-ray. Or let's say they have a PDA that's, a, that's causing pulmonary edema, right? That's where you would give more CPAP, right? So that's what you're looking at here, that CPAP. All these are some of the older ones, but they're out there. People are still using these guys. So I uh, just got to know what you're using at your facility. Unfortunately, we won't be able to play with any of our CPAPs or even bubble CPAPs that are hot in our lab. But uh, hopefully you'll be able to get to see those out there if you haven't already. Indications, uh, decreased FRC, so very poor expansion on their x-ray. Uh, obviously, we're not going to make a baby go into a body box <laughs> and do an FRC and a vital capacity and all that stuff. Uh, so that would be radiological evidence of poor volume expansion, right? Airway collapse, of course, that would be on x-ray um, weaning from the ventilator, where we're taking them down to an SIMV rate of 10 or 8 and... Right, we're just leaving them on there, and then some protocols out there even just say put the baby in CPAP and pressure support. Right, CPAP, uh, even the oscillator you can wean to extubate off the oscillator. All you do is turn off the piston, and it's still giving CPAP, and they would draw a gas, and there you go. Uh, abnormal physical presentation, of course, if a kid has um, a lot of uh, edema going on, especially those those TTN babies, those TTN babies more and more, they're saying instead of letting them struggle initially, give them CPAP to help reabsorb some of that fluid um, ultimately, or to help relieve their work of breathing so their lymph tissue can help resolve that as well. Abnormal ABGs, of course, the hypoxic hypercarbic because of Laplace's law, working hard, they might just need some CPAP just to help overcome that initially. So usually about five to six is where you'd start. Uh, and we can increase this here as well until their saturation's achieved, but usually this is where we'll sort of stay for a lot of patients. Uh, FiO2, I would cross this out. I need to update this presentation massively. Uh, FiO2, if we're starting them on FiO2, remember the correct answer, and according to the boards and according to NRP and all those other things, you start with the FiO2 that they were on in their last device. So if you're extubating from a vent and you're on 26%, what FiO2 do you start them on the CPAP machine? 26%. If you're intubating, you have a kid on CPAP and you're intubating and they're on 26%, what FIO2 do you start them with on the ventilator? 26%, right? So this is what you're looking at here. So we're going to start them uh, with whatever they were on on their previous device. This is a drug. We titrate as needed. Thank goodness. All right. So you're going to go and titrate to your SAT goals for that patient, which will be different compared if they're premature or term. So we're gonna wean their FIO2 
to their goals and to the blood gases. So we should see a lot less retractions. So just like in adults, you should see less work of breathing if it's therapeutic. So if I start a baby on a CPAP of five, and I see the respiratory rate start to decrease, not Brady, but decrease. And I see their nasal flaring and I see their retractions start to resolve. Then I know I'm being therapeutic. If I don't hear them grunting because they needed that back pressure, then I know I'm being therapeutic, right? So this is one of the things that we can look at. Now, there's always the chance of an approved looking x-ray. However, if they have a pulmonary edema from a PDA, uh, then that's not something that would show up right away, but I would see that therapeutically we're making a difference with their respiratory drive, right? So same thing with an adult. If I have an adult that comes into the ER and I just start them off on a CPAP of seven or a CPAP of five just to get them used to the BiPAP, right, to get them used to wearing a mask and the pressure, and I start to see the respiratory rate start to drop and the heart rate start to drop, not Brady, but drop and resolve to a normal level, then it's therapeutic, right? I'm having that therapeutic effect. So that's what we're talking about here. So failure of CPAP, if their PO2 is really low and they're on a lot of oxygen, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and have to intubate them. So I'd remember this for the final, of course, see if their pH is less than 725, we already talked about this. PO2 over, uh, CO2 over 50 or 60, that's when we're looking at, uh, this is still not working. A's, B's, and D's, let's do. Apneas, bradycardias, and desaturations. So A's, B's, and D's uh, are something that we look at daily. That's something we give report on in the NICU, and some may or may not do that, but um, this is something we always give report on. Apneas, bradycardias, and desaturations. How many of them do they have, and how many are self-stimmed, where the baby came out of it there on their own, and how many of it did we have to take intervention with? So if a baby has apnea as a, uh, a prematurity, then they're going to have an issue where they go apneic, they stop breathing, and then they're going to start stop have a bradycardia, and then they're going to desaturate. That's an apnea, bradycardia, desaturation. It is important when you're looking at A's, B's, and D's to know who came first. Was it the apnea that came first, or was it the bradycardia that came first? So they might have more of a cardiac start to the whole thing, where the heart decided to brady down, and then they went apneic, and then they desaturated. Or it could be the respiratory one. They went apneic first, then went bradycardic, then desaturated. So it's good to know who's causing the issues <laughs> when you're looking at this situation. Nevertheless, uh, the treatment for uh, A's, B's, and D's is going to be methylxanthine, right? So that'll be your caffeine citrate, as well as giving them uh, some sort of positive pressure airway stimulation. Well, that's CPAP. Uh, so if they still have a large number of A's, B's, and D's, especially ones that we have to stimulate out of them, that might be failure of CPAP. We might have to go more towards a ram cannula non-invasive ventilation with um, two, by pressure two, le two pressure level settings, and or go ahead and intubate. So that's something that we will be looking at as well. Hazards of CPAP, of course, decreased pulmonary blood flow from overdistension, of course, if we have too much of it. Decreased venous return, right? That's all that overdistension. Increased ICPs, we talked about that with the jugulars draining uh, blood back into the thoracic cage. So the, remember, every time you make an increase in your ventilator mean airway pressure or CPAP or any type of respiratory pressure, that increases thoracic pressure, it can easily back pressure the veins into the brain or reduce vein drainage from the brain and therefore have a higher risk of an intracranial pressure going up, which on these babies can be very bad in the very premature babies. Can also cause things like a pneumothorax, very bad, especially with these babies, because what do you know about their chest wall? Very, very compliant chest wall, right? Do they have a rigid rib cage? No, the rib cage is very flexible. So that means the rib cage won't restrict the lungs from hyperinflation. On an adult, that is a safety mechanism. It's not the primary safety mechanism, but it is a safety mechanism that the rib cage can restrict the lungs from expanding and therefore prevent a pneumothorax. So these guys have a higher chance for spont pneumo, spontaneous pneumothorax, as well as a uh, pneumothorax that's 
uh, given by a mechanical device. <laughs> gastric distension, especially with CPAP and non-invasive, even in your adults, gastric distension is a possibility. So it's one of the things that they, they were tying down to necrotizing enterocolitis for a while, was those babies tended to be on CPAP for a longer time. Now there's a whole area of debate there, and so I won't go into it, but for a while there, they were associating it heavily with uh, non-invasive because it, in theory, it was distending the gut and causing issues with the gut as well. But gastric extension is a big thing. They won't have enough room for the milk um, or the uh, nutrition in their stomach. They'll have a lot of back pressure there. They'll have higher residuals. Uh, and then they'll be less likely to get nutrition. And remember, nutrition, next to safe ventilating practices, is going to be one of the best things to help with alveolar development and repairing bad lung tissue. So something you got to be careful, careful about. Uh, nasal obstruction, of course, uh, boogers. They can be dried out. I had a couple of kids where they were just they were deciding they had increased A's, B's, and D's, and they were looking at going to more invasive ventilation. And all I would do is suck out their nose, and they'd have some thick boogers up there. And sure enough, they were fine after that because now they're getting the pressure. They were on nasal CPAP, so they just had dried out. Even though we we're using humidity and all that stuff, it can happen. Necrosis, of course, especially with the nasal prongs. Uh, corrosion of the septums, all those things were big deals, and so we had a protocol where we'd have to switch between the nasal prongs and the nasal mask to avoid this, and you need to make sure there's no blanching. That's the biggest thing I can recommend to you. There's no blanching around the nose or the nares or the septum. That should help avoid that. Contraindications to CPAP, upper airway abnormalities, um, a coin altresia, the first one I can think of, right? Their nasal cavity is completely closed off, Putting them on nasal CPAP, probably not going to do much for them. So things like that you got to be aware of. Any air leak syndromes like PIE, um, that could obviously make that situation worse because now you're adding more pressure and that could easily cause issues there. A CDH, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. This is actually uh, one of those patients where you will not follow NRP directly. If you know this kid is a congenital diaphragmatic hernia, uh, in front of you, like you, you are highly suspecting it, and they're in respiratory distress, which most most of them will be. You will intubate them before you will give them the 30 to 40 seconds of non-invasive. Right. So if you're looking at your NRP algorithm, you have to usually give them 30 to 40 seconds of non-invasive, and then you would intubate them on these kids because of the risk of gastric distension. Uh, you do not give them CPAP, you do not give them non-invasive, you bypass that area and you would directly intubate to avoid uh, gastric issues. Weaning uh, these patients, uh, underlying processes improved. So the apneas, bradys, and desaturations, the A's, B's, and D's. So a kid will be on CPAP and they might be on CPAP for just, um, they let's say they were a C-section kid with uh, transient tachypnea, right, TTN baby. Um, so they might just be their transient to get me. They, their fetal lung fluid is now reabsorbed mostly. And so now they can come off of it, right? So the underlying process has improved. FIO2s, usually we go by 4%. Uh, some hospitals will vary here. So just pay attention to your policies and procedures at the hospital you'll be practicing at. Usually we try to keep them on 40% or less. Uh, wean pressures by two. So we don't take big steps. Remember with babies, we take baby steps, right? With babies, you take baby steps. Small FIO2 changes, small pressure changes, weaning, um, nitrate with very, very small changes. It's all small changes, right? Um, if the ABG is pretty sa stable and everything is looking good, we might just take them down to their high flow uh, cannula and see how uh, when you're putting a kid on a vent, please look at the vent management protocol I have in Blackboard. Uh, it's much more updated than this presentation. So, like I said, I need to update this. So, have fun with the classic settings. All right, pick pressure is usually 20 to 25. We already talked about this. Try to keep it under 30. So, 20 to 25 is very common. The more premature they are, the higher you'll have to go because the compliance is lower. Solely just for chest rise, we talked about this. This more at delivery, not just you're in the NICU and you don't see good chest rise, increase the pressure. No, you're going to auscultate. You're going to make sure that there's not something else like 
they're slightly extubated or they have a mucus plug, right? Or the ET tube isn't kinked in some sort of area, right? So there's other things that could cause that. Um, so initially, if you're intubating a patient, especially in the OR at a delivery, you're just going to make sure you want to see at least some chest rise. Uh, auscultation, you want to make sure you have end tidal. Make sure you're in the airway, the baby PB caps. Uh, respiratory rate, usually we'll start around a rate of 30. It's very rare we'll start a rate any higher than 30. Uh, they can start up to 60, um, but usually 25 to 30 is a good place to start uh, for the respiratory rate, which we did this in the lab. Uh, some of these vents, even the, uh, the 840, oh, classic, uh, can go up to 150 breaths per minute. So a lot of these conventional ventilators can go pretty high if we needed them to for mid-frequency ventilation. Don't worry about mid-frequency ventilation yet. If you want to know more about mid-frequency ventilation, come see me in the lab sometime and we'll go over it. I love mid-frequency, but that's not something I'll go into here. Um, we can decrease it to accommodate more spontaneous breathing. That's how we wean these babies, right? You'll have an SIMV rate of 30, and then you, if they have a really good blood gas and they're, so, they're getting better and better. Now we'll go to an SIMV rate of 15, right? And I'm just saying over time, not like within two vent checks, right? Over time, right? So we'll go to a, vent of 50, a rate of 15, and then they'll be looking good. Their cap gas looks good. Their x-rays are looking good. Everything else looking good. Then we'll go to a rate of 10, right? And then if everything's looking good, maybe Maybe we extubate them to CPAP. Maybe we extubate them to RAM cannula, right? So this is all what we're going to look at. So that's how you wean these babies. You just slowly decrease the set rate to where it's now CPAP and pressure support most of the time. All right, PEEP. We talked about the PEEP. Usually five to six is where we'd start. We can decrease if we think there's risk of ICPs or high mean error pressures, risk for ICPs, things like that. Um, so this is something that you'll titrate up and down, but usually five to six is a good place to start. FIO2, this is whatever it is to get their SAT goals, but if you do not have, if you're in your SAT goals, use whatever they need for a good PO2 and a good saturation. So let's say their SAT goals are 88, or sorry, 85 to 92. Right, so you're going to titrate based upon that. Um, so that's something that you'd be looking at. Eye time, we already talked about eye time. Normally, uh, term infant, a normal spontaneous eye time is around a half second, um, but uh, a lot of times it's easier just to start at 0.4 seconds. Especially your preemies, they're going to need a lot shorter eye time. So that's where you get that 0.25 to 0.5. Second, and most of the babies you'll have on the vent are the premature ones. You'll get some meconium aspiration babies and all that stuff where you, where you, in theory, you could use a longer eye time, but usually that 0.25 to 0.5 is what you're looking at. And when we go to a rate of 40 or so on the baby, on the, the, ventilate, the respiratory rate setting, uh, that's when we'd usually start to decrease the eye time to help reduce air uh, auto peeping on those babies too. ID ratios, the cool thing, because their lung compliance is so low, that means, and their time constants are so fast, right, because their compliance is low, that means their time constant will be shorter, like a shot glass. Short to deliver it because they're small volumes, short to empty it because they're small volumes, right? Because their time constant is shorter, we can run a lot closer I to E ratio. So instead of a one to two, one to three, we can run a one to one and a half or one to two, right? So we can actually run closer than a one to two and still not have to worry as much about auto peak. Inspiratory flow, if you still have this setting or a ventilator that requires you to set this, you'd set it about six to 10, just like you would with your flow inflation bag and mask. If you were worried about chaotic flow or anything like that, a small easy tube, raw, your time constant was too long, you can always decrease the flow rate, um, help reduce, uh, help get more transitional flow, so on and so forth. So too much flow will increase raw, so in theory you would then go from 10 liters to nine liters, right? Too little flow will not fill the lungs in the time that it's needed. So then you might have inadequate tidal volume delivery if it's too low. So just somewhere in this area, and you're just going to have to adjust it per the patient's physiological responses. Trigger. Uh, if you're on pressure, negative one to negative two, anywhere between 0.15 and one liter, 
for flow. Uh, I have yet to put a kit on pressure treg uh, for uh, uh, mechanical ventilation, but there it is if you need it. Um, and then, so this is something you're going to have to titrate based upon each baby or the hospital's policy and procedure. So when we're looking at this, you need to make sure you're looking at the baby's belly and the monitor, right? Or the rest or the respiratory rate on the ventilator. So if the baby's only triggering 30 breaths a minute and it's reading 65, then maybe there's water in the circuit. Maybe that's too sensitive, right? Or maybe the patient is breathing 60 times a minute. You can see their belly moving 60 times a minute and the ventilator is only delivering 25 breaths per minute. That means you're not sensitive enough. It's just delivering only barely what the vent settings have it for. So this is something you're going to have to titrate from patient to patient. Yay! Just like um, alarms, right? And we already talked about alarms in the lab, so I won't spend time here talking about alarms. But right, for each individual patient, you're going to have to set those alarms differently, right? A term, meconium aspiration, you know, 4,000 gram baby, it's going to be way different than a baby that weighs 525 grams, right? So that's something that you guys are going to have to adjust from patient to patient. Uh, parameters, CO2 uh, and PO2, uh, what parameters do you change first in these situations? Well, usually it's not the rate unless, they're, unless their CO2s are looking really high, uh, really low, and we're weaning them off of the ventilator, then we're going to decrease the rate first. If their CO2s are, are looking really high, instead of increasing the rate, they might actually increase the pressure. Depending on what's going on with their x-ray, they might actually increase the pressure and or pressure support. Right, um, so that depends which way you're going. Are you titrating them off the ventilator or are you titrating them for more support? If you need to titrate them for more ventilation, then obviously your PIP and or your pressure support would be some, or eye time would be the longer uh, other way to do it. But usually it's your delta P that you would change first. Uh, hypoxemia, so if the PO2 is less than 50 and they're on 50%, um, uh, then that's one of those things where they're, they could easily be in a refractory hypoxemia state. So remember in refractory hypoxemia, the more FIO2 you give, uh, they're not really going to have a change in their saturations. They're not going to really have a change in their PO2s. So in a refractory hypoxemia state, you're supposed to give more pressure. The theory is here that you'd have more surface area. They're atelectatic and you'd be giving them more surface area. So the 60-60 rule is something that can be uh, look at, looked at here. I think pill be, not pill beam, Gary Persing's NBRC review, he does the 50-50 rule where they're on more than 50% oxygen, you'd increase the PEEP or the pressure for a refractory hypoxemia. Uh, on your exams, I will test you on the 60-60 rule, so if they're on more than 60%, you'd increase the pressure. Same thing, titrating up or down. So let's say they're on 60% and a PEEP of 6, and their, um, P, their saturations were really, really good then you would titrate down, right? Weaning diseases resolved, that's one of the big things. Make sure like their TTN is resolved or whatever it is is resolved. Their RDS has been, uh, they're able to be on minimum settings. FI2 less than 40%, yes, it's very rare we would extubate on anything over 40%. Uh, PO2 should be good and stable, so should their saturations. Peeps, like I said, baby steps. Babies on a ventilator, take baby steps. Usually we'll take it to a PIP of 5 or a CPAP of 5. Uh, decrease PIP until it's down to a minimal change. So we're looking at a delta P or a change of pressure of around 5 to 10, right? So it's like having a patient, an adult patient on a CPAP of 5 and a pressure support of 5 to 10, right? So something minimal there. So decrease the respiratory rate because we're assuming SIMV here, right? So if we're assuming SIMV, that means the lower the respiratory rate, the more it looks like a, a spontaneous wean or spontaneous breathing trial. Remember, that's something we go slow with. We gotta look at their blood sugars, we gotta look at their nutrition, right? All that stuff um, before we do this. And we gotta make sure we fit them for the whatever gear they're going to wear, whether it's a Ram Kangle, make sure we get the right size and all the gear in the room, right? So this is a slow process. 
extubation is not an emergent procedure. So make sure if there's any scheduled C-sections or anything like that going on, uh, that those are all um, taken care of or anything like that. Because if you extubate and the baby doesn't do well, it can be a long time period between extubation and uh, reintubation and getting them restabilized. So this is something you got to make sure you have time to do if it's a controlled extubation. Uh, it's not something I would do in the middle of things, right? Now, extubation, if it's accidental, that's a whole separate story. But if we're planning on extubating this baby, we're going to hold the feeds. They might already start caffeine uh, on the baby. Remember, that's to help with apnea prematurity. They're going to have a lot less airway stimulation now that there's something stuck in their air. Some, not something stuck in their airway, right? Uh, so we might start them on CPAP or RAM cannula where we can give them uh, a set rate and a PIP and a PEEP, right? So it's like baby BiPAP, so to speak. Uh, and we're just going to monitor them pretty closely. Uh, sometimes we put um, some stuff over the top of their, not their lip, but over the septum area and over the top of uh, the pendulum in that area to help... Um, protect their skin and avoid any issues of skin breakdown from the CPAP or the prongs or anything like that. High frequency of ventilation. Whew, we made it here. Uh, this is something that we're looking at for these patients that have very, very sick, very, um, uh, very hard to ventilate uh, lung tissue. So the more premature they are, the more likely they are that the respiratory zone isn't very developed yet, and it's gonna take extreme vent settings to keep a good acid base balance on them. So why high frequency ventilation? Well, it's gonna help reduce the, the peak to valley that tidal volume or pressure control ventilation does. Because remember, when we're walking on uh, normal legs, it's great, it works fine. Let's say I have a broken tib fib on my right leg and I'm walking. That broken tib fib, every time I step on that right leg, will get worse and worse and worse. So if we have sick lung tissue and we ventilate it normally, it can actually cause the tissue to get worse and more damage can happen. So high frequency ventilation is a way to almost, for that metaphor, put a cast or to stabilize that bone, right? Or to stabilize the lung tissue so it doesn't have as much peak to valley. So the tidal volumes, instead of being a normal anatomical tidal volume, now they're smaller than your anatomical dead space. We have extremely small tidal volumes and we're just leaving the lungs sort of in a recruited state. And that will allow for the lungs to heal and or reduce trauma while the lungs are in a sick state. So the idea here is to be very, very gentle with their ventilation. So a lot of NICUs have a, high, uh, a, a quick trigger to put a kid on high frequency, and that's okay with me personally, but that's a whole anecdotal thing, right? So uh, bad ventilation, these pressures are, can be, when you put it, just like path will always go the le path of least resistance, flow will always go the path of least resistance. So when we put these kids on a ventilator, uh, all that gas flow, all that tidal volume delivery, it's just going to go to those compliant areas, which is usually the transition zone, and just destroy it. And so that's why high frequency can be more gentle ventilation for these kids and reduce volume trauma and reduce trauma. So distal airways rather than the alveoli is the most compliant part of this and this is what we're showing you here where that transition zone right here we have the respiratory zone here we have the conducting airways that have that exoskeleton of cartilage and it's this transition zone that has no cartilage right here that's just over distending and causing those issues. So when you look at a PIE x-ray and see those loops, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing that transition zone just destroyed. So distal airway issues, this is where we're looking at PIE. And air leak syndromes like PIE, so what can eventually happen to this tissue if it over distends, it can pop a hole, right? And cause a pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum and pneumopericardium, right? So it causes a lot of damage ultimately. So high frequency ventilation, it's a respiratory rate over 150 breaths a minute. Uh, this was a board exam question, even for the adult critical care specialist exam. So even if you plan on never working with kids, 
and you want your adult critical care specialist credential, this was one of the questions, right? So you're looking at one hertz being 60 breaths or cycles per minute. Um, so the reason why they call them cycles, and we're looking at hertz here, with an oscillator, it is one of the only ventilators out there where the breath is being delivered and sucked back out. Delivered, sucked back out. Delivered, sucked back out. So it has both positive and negative sort of oscillations. So that's where it has that drum on it that pushes, pulls, pushes, pulls, pushes, pulls. And so that's why it's called a cycle. So you set your respiratory rate in hertz. So if I set a rate um, of five hertz, that would be 300 breaths per minute, right? So that's what you're looking at here is 60 cycles or breaths per minute uh, when you're looking at this. So they're going to ask you what's their respiratory rate if they're on a hertz of three, so so on and so forth. Low pressures, that's one of the big advantages of it is it helps reduce pressures in the transition zone, right, where you see this, this distended alveoli and then this atelectatic area. And so it's this area here that got distended. Well, if we have very low volume change, right, if our volume is less than anatomical dead space, but we're just moving gas super fast into and out of, then we have a lot less lateral pressure and therefore less distension of this area, making it worse. So we're stopping the damage, right? Lung, lungs heal. So very, very small volumes will decrease the expansion of this trust, uh, this transitional airway. So it reduces the risk or decreases the risk of barotrauma overall. Because we can, even though we're using the same mean airway pressure or even higher mean airway pressure, ultimately less of it will get to the respiratory zone because as it sends the pressure in waves. So let's say this is a trachea. With an oscillator, it's sending pressure in waves. And so these waves touch the side of the airways. And so therefore, when it touches the side of the airways, it actually slows down and reduces pressure because it's dragging, right? This is all physics. It's dragging it. And so by the time it gets to the transition zone and to the respiratory zone, it's lost pressure from here at the trachea, the ET tube, to down here. So even if we have the same mean airway pressure that we have uh, from conventional ventilation, ultimately when it gets down to the transition zone and to the respiratory zone, we have a lot less pressure being exerted on the, those anatomical structures. I hope that all made sense. <laughs> uh, so we reduce the risk of barotrauma, even if we're running the same mean airway pressure. Because of the physics of the breath delivery and what it's doing, it reduces that risk to those sensitive parts of their airway. So preventative and rescue therapies. Preventative, it used to be with high frequency ventilation, there's two types, high frequency oscillator and high frequency jet. Well, we already went over that the oscillator would Give a breath, take a breath, give a breath, take a breath, right? And this is your mean airway pressure in between, right? And you would oscillate, right? That's what we're looking at here. Um, with the jet, it would give a breath and then, just like a conventional ventilator, let it out and then give a breath, let it out, right? And so that's what you're looking at here is it has... The one has active exhalation, the oscillator has active exhalation, the jet has passive exhalation. And that's the one of the key differences between the two. And that's why one of these, the, that's why you have different settings for both of these. And that's why one of these, in personal opinion as well, is better at air leak syndromes, and we can go into that too. So there's preventative and rescue uh, indications for high frequency ventilation. Two is jet and the oscillator. There used to be the high frequency full interrupter. There's a couple other devices that were out there, but those are the two primary ones currently. So they high frequency oscillation and high frequency jet ventilation. So preventative says this baby's x-ray is looking poor or we know this kid has a, a hypoplastic left lung or we know that they have some sort of issue, not left heart, hypoplastic left lung or you know something like that's going on. We know that they have something that can cause a lot of lung damage. 
uh, maybe we put them on the oscillator to be gentle to the good lung, right, and have good oxygenation and ventilation. Or, um, so we were preventive, we didn't wait till they failed conventional, we just went ahead and put them on it because we know uh, it can ultimately avoid damage to the tissue. There's rescue, of course, the baby goes into RDS, they have high FiO2 requirements. Uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, that's something we we already talked about too. They have that very, very small, usually left lung, uh, so that right lung could easily get destroyed, uh, and it has high oxygen requirements, so we can put them on it. Coronary aspiration syndrome, any of the air leak syndromes, if conventional ventilation, right, they, if they're still failing blood gases, uh, why they're on conventional ventilation. That's something that we have to watch out for too. So there's preventative and rescue indications. So oscillator and jet, this is where usually you're looking at 4 to 11 hertz for the jet and about 4 to 15 hertz um, for the oscillator. Uh, they work differently. Um, like I said, one has active inhalation and exhalation. One has active inhalation and passive exhalation, right? The jet has passive exhalation. So the advantage of the passive exhalation is if I have a hole in my lungs, and there's videos of this online, and I'm on the oscillator and I have lateral pressure, that means pressure can escape very easily, and I'm gonna have a lot less pressure that goes distal to that because the path of least resistance is out that hole, right? So that pneumothorax can get bigger. So that's the oscillator. And it'll still work for air leak syndromes, but I'll show you the physics with the jet. The jet, because it has passive exhalation, it changes the way the gas comes out. So that means because the jets go down the center of the airway, because it's passive, that means the CO2, the heavier gas, actually does this helical motion around the lateral parts of the airway and swirls its way up and out so that this hole over here that normally would let gas out it's not nearly as likely because there's less pressure being exerted onto the walls of the airway that will allow for a lot better or a lot less chance of that pneumothorax getting worse and a lot better chance that that pneumothorax can resolve itself so if you have an air leak syndrome Based upon the physics, the jet's your friend. So pneumothorax, pneumo anything, PIE, if you and if that's if your facility runs it. If not, the oscillator can still work. You just gotta know that, that pressure there. The other advantage that a jet has, right? I sh I showed you this drawing, is it doesn't require near as much pressure uh, to get down to the respiratory zone. Remember, it's going down the center of the airway. And then the lateral walls, that's that CO2. So we're not losing pressure on the walls of the airway. So if we have a kid that's hemodynamically unstable, so we have a kid that's hypotensive, we're going to have a lot less lateral airway pressure with a jet than an oscillator. So the jet is actually more effective or more hemodynamically friendly in that situation. So if you had to pick between the two, and a kid had very low hemodynamics, in theory, the jet would actually have a lot better um, hemodynamics uh, with it compared to the oscillator. All right, the oscillator. <laughs> 1991 is when it was officially approved, 98 for the adult. Duke was the big one that did the adult oscillator study. So these are your settings. You set the mean airway pressure, which you use the same or a little bit higher, three to five centimeters above, your mean air pressure from conventional vent settings. Your delta P, also known as your, your um, amplitude, right? So this is also known as amplitudes. They might say go up on their amplitude, right? They, these are equivalent terms. Um, hertz is your respiratory rate. Remember, for every one hertz, it's 60 cycles per minute. So you might change like a half hertz or a whole hertz, and you're looking at a change of 30 to 60 breaths per minute. So it's a pretty big change. Uh, flow, if they're really premature and they have a good website, this is of the care fusion uh, that makes the oscillator. The flow, usually you do 10 to 12 liters a minute. 
Uh, if they're a very, very small baby, let's say they're less than 1,000 grams. Uh, if they're a bigger baby, you might do closer to 20 liters per minute. If you're running this on a PICU kid and you have the 3100B, you can be running 30 to 40 liters a minute. So it depends on the size of your baby how much bias flow, which is this guy over here, how much bias flow you're going to use. So up here is your mean airway pressure setting. Over here is your amplitude or your hertz, or sorry, your amplitude or your delta P. Your hertz is the bottom part there. Your flow, we already talked about, is this guy over here. It's set by a Thorp tube that's over there. And then your I time, and it's an I time percent, is set right here in the middle. So this is your I time percent. And you're going to always set it at 33%. So the I time percent, that's a 1 to 2 IDE ratio if you're doing the math. There is a chance if someone's hypercarbic on the oscillator that they might increase it closer to 50% or 1 to 1 ratio. It makes the ventilation, it makes the lungs wiggle even more and therefore can enhance uh, uh, CO2 removal. So that's something that you would be looking at there. So an I time percent of 33% is what you would traditionally set. That's the last setting that we would typically change. Usually if a kid was acidotic, we'll change the amplitude. Uh, if we change the amplitude as much as we can, uh, then we might go down on the hertz. And then um, the flow, as long as we have an appropriate flow setting, usually we don't change that. Um, the I time in theory would be the third thing we can change to get more CO2 removal. So you'd increase the I, I time for a CO2 removal. You would decrease the respiratory rate, and we'll talk about that, for CO2 removal. Or you would increase the amplitude for CO2 removal. Now I will put this little caveat here. Before I make any of these changes for CO2 removal, before the I time, before the Hertz, before the Delta P, before I would do any of that, I'm going to make sure I get a chest x-ray and look at lung distension. Because Hooke's Law says as a balloon gets to the point where it's almost about to burst, the compliance is going to be super low, right? So if I blow up a balloon to the point where it's almost going to burst, is the surface area of that balloon or the tension that's on that balloon, is it going to wiggle very easily? Absolutely not, remember, because the compliance is low. So if we're over distending this kid, I can make all the changes I want to on my amplitude, my hertz, and my eye time. It's not going to help remove CO2. So I need to make sure my map is not over distending that kid. I hope that makes sense. So if it is, decrease that. That will allow for more wiggle, and therefore I did not have to make any of these other rent setting changes, right? I hope you all get that, right? So usually we get an x-ray within 30 minutes or so. It depends on different facilities, and we try to see where their volume is. If they're at 10 ribs, <laughs> that's too much. That's what's causing the hypercarbia. Right, that's what's causing the low sets because they're hypercarbic, because they can't move any part of their respiratory zone. So then the setting is pretty simple. We just decrease their mean airway pressure. Whew. Okay. This is what you're looking at here for the settings. So over here is your mean airway pressure, your amplitude, your hertz, and your eye time percent. I know it says 32, but it's 33% when you're setting this up. Here's your flow, here's your mean airway pressure knob, and here's your pressure pop-off. And here is your alarm zone over here. Here's your Knight Rider waveform. It just goes back and forth. It's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, start, stop button, and then power buttons down here uh, below the arm. <laughs> um, so these are alarms. You'll have your high pressure setting and your low pressure setting. We'd always do plus three, so let's say there's a, a 25. So we would set this at 28, and then we do minus 2. So that would be 23. So we do plus 3 minus 2 for the alarm settings. And so this is the ever important alarm silence button. Everybody's RT's favorite button. Uh, and then this one uh, would, so this button would start stop the, um, the drum 
that would move back and forth. So if we wanted to listen to heart sounds, you can't listen to heart sounds unless you stop this guy from going. And they would still get the CPAP from the bias flow. So you press that button, stop the drum, and so you can listen to heart sounds or anything, or belly sounds, right, for gastric sounds. And then you press it again to start back up again. Um, so this is your piston centering uh, thing, and there is usually a knob down here on the 3100A, which is your neonate oscillator, and you have to adjust the piston. So where this waveform that's moving back and forth like this, you have to adjust it. So if it's only moving back and forth and it's over to the side, or let's say it's moving back and forth and it's over to the other side, then that means the piston's off center and they could have uneven ventilation. So we need to make sure it's centered. So you'd use a little dial to center it. Your FiO2, where's your FiO2? Do you guys see it? You don't, because it's the blender over here, <laughs> right? And then they have the fancy readout. So the FiO2 is actually on the side of the darn machine. It's pretty interesting. This whole thing is run by a nine volt battery on the back um, for the display. It's pretty fun to play with and use. Raw. The jet ventilator, this thing is amazing. So the oscillator, it's own standalone device. You take them off the conventional ventilator and you put them on the oscillator. The jet goes in line with your current ventilator. Now I believe, I think Drager has it where the oscillator is an integral setting, but it's not FDA approved in the US yet. So you, they would be on the Drager and you would just sort of press a button or go into a screen and it would switch over to oscillator without having to switch the whole machine out. Nice. Um, we'll see how it goes if it gets FDA approved in the US. The jet goes in line with your conventional ventilator. So what this does, it's like putting a metaneb or an IPV, and this is just a very crude way of saying it, but it might help with you getting the initial concept. It's like um, putting a, a IPV where it does those pulses, puff, 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 or a metaneb, puff, 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 puff. And you're putting it in line with the vent circuit. So what that's doing is adding those puffs, those pulses of breath to help augment gas movement and to flush out and to remove CO2, right? And that reduces the amount of pressure you need to use ultimately. And so what's cool is you have a ventilator that you can just pretty much set it on CPAP and no pressure support. And you put this in line with the patient and allow for efficient CO2 removal and very gentle pressures or very gentle lung ventilation, ultimately. Uh, and then Benel has a great website, and I all rec I recommend you can play with the settings and all that stuff on the website. So please go to Benel's website and play with it. So the PIP, the rate, um, very similar, the iTime, conventional PIP, these are all things that we'd set on the conventional ventilator. So we can either set the conventional ventilator with just PEEP and no pressure support, or we could set it at a rate of 10, right? Like what we were talking about with SIMV and a PIP of, I don't know, 15 and an iTime of point, right? So you can have it where you can augment the jet minute ventilation with your conventional ventilator ventilation. Just remember when you do that, you're adding more lateral airway pressure. So if they have an air leak syndrome and they ventilate just fine without the conventional stuff, then they may not use it. So the only place in Colorado that I'm currently aware of that uses the jet is PSL or Rocky Mountain Hospital for Children at PSL. Um, and then the FiO2 is controlled by your uh, conventional ventilator. So everything that says conventional on down, this whole section here is all what's controlled by the conventional ventilator. And then this is the stuff that you would set on that machine, on the that itself. Uh, servo pressure, and it talks about this on the slide. Uh, this is something that we can look at how hard the machine's working. If it's an increased work, that means um, the patient is getting better. If the servo is decreasing, that means the patient's getting worse. Their volumes are getting worse. Their raw is going up. So the patient's working harder. So one of the things that you have to look at is what their servo or their working pressure is. And that can actually be a good indicator going on. So this is the slide. If you click on it and then you scroll down, uh, probably not on this lecture, but on the actual slide from the Blackboard, you'll be able to see it. Uh, that can actually tell you a lot of good information.
So here would be your conventional ventilator, and then here would be your jet with the light pulse. And I think they have a more modern version now. Here's your ET tube. It's not appropriate to that size of the baby. But uh, the jet would have this little uh, gas pulsations, and this would be what would cut off the flow. And there's better pictures here in a second. And it would read back to the, the, the jet. And the ventilator over here would go to, obviously, a heated circuit, right? And then to the baby. So they're getting that CPAP and or CPAP in tidal volume, right, or pressure support. And then they're just getting augmentation. So your primary thing here is the jets doing the ventilation and you're using the conventional ventilator just for FiO2 and PEEP for the most part. If they're not adequately ventilated with just the jet, then we can add a PIP and a rate and all that stuff with conventional. But usually if we can, especially if we're looking at air leak syndrome, they'll just use the, the jet part for ventilation only. So the conventional ventilator flow, you don't need near as much because we have more flow coming in there. This is the 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 um, the jet device that I was circling earlier, and so that just sort of cuts off the flow there. And now I think they have a better one, but the patient box here is what will cut off the flow. If you've ever heard an oscillator, you know it's an oscillator because you hear this puff 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 puff. It's very very loud. Um, with the jet, it's actually a lot quieter because of the way it works. So big difference there. And this is the adapter. You just put this in the hub of the ET tube where it reads back that monitoring back to the jet. All right. And this is what you're looking at here with the jet. This is what I was crudely trying to draw earlier, where you see it going down the center of the airways. Because it's a passive exhalation, the physics allow for gas delivery to be down the center of the airway and reduce the amount of pressure being lost and therefore I can use lower pressures and be just as effective at keeping distending pressure and then I'll be able to have more hemodynamic friendly relationship with my patient. So gas flow comes in and then you're going to have that helical motion of gas flow coming out that allows for it. And literally when you're looking at mucus plugs on these patients, for an oscillator patient, A, make sure that circuit is sloppy. That's like the only thing, and I've told you guys about that before. Make sure you have good humidity in your circuit for the oscillator. Those patients can dry out really easily. But when you're looking at these patients with the oscillator, the secretions or mucus plugs would tend to sort of stick and just sort of stay here at the end of the ET tube, right? They just sort of stick there. But with the jet, you would actually see it come and swirl out into the ET tube. So you'd actually see it hanging out in the ET tube. It's pretty radical how different um, the different physics will affect it. So the oscillator helps prevent air leaks, but it's no more effective than conventional ventilation at helping resolve an air leak. So if, a if you do have a kid that has a pneumo this or a pneumo that, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, as far as the evidence goes, it says uh, you, you're not necessarily justified in switching them over to a uh, high frequency because it's something that you're used gentle ventilation to prevent it, not to fix it, right? Um, so it's no more effective than conventional ventilation at fixing a pneumothorax, ultimately. Um, so this is, I believe this is PSL. My daughter was over here. She was one bed over. Um, so this is an older, cruder picture. But here you have the, the banal jet vet. Here's a, your, the older version of the nitric. Uh, here's the Christmas tree of IV pumps. And here's the ventilator, right? And so you can see this kid's an open warmer. What do you see down here? You see that chest tube, right? So this kid has a pneumo. And so that's something that they can use to help with those kids. So for vent management, if you need to remove CO2, you'd increase amplitude or you would decrease the hertz. If you need to increase oxygenation, you would either increase the map or increase the FI2. So the map, this depends on where they're at in their chest x-ray. If they're at six ribs expanded, does it make any sense to go up on their FI2? Absolutely not. We're going to increase the mean air pressure. They have good expansion on their chest x-ray, then we're going to increase FiO2. So the amplitude, that's the change of pressure. So increasing it is like increasing your tidal volume. So why do I say decreasing the hertz? So here we have a situation where I have very fast respiratory rate and a very slow respiratory rate. 
So the CO2 is what gets removed during each of these breaths because remember it's an active on both inhalation and exhalation. So I have a shorter time constant to get rid of carbonic acid, to get rid of CO2. Shorter time. If I decrease my Hertz, then I have a longer time constant, a longer time period to get rid of even more CO2. So on this machine, if I decrease the Hertz, right, then that means I'll have better CO2 removal for that patient. That's why if the kid's acidotic, instead of going up on their amplitude, they might actually say, hey, go down on their Hertz. I hope that makes sense. Right? That's because there's more space or more time to get rid of that CO2. On a jet, uh, you could either, if, they're, if you're trying to get rid of CO2, you could increase the jet pip, right? Um, or you can, if you are also using conventional ventilator pip, you can, you could, or let's say you're using just the jet pip, then you can go up on the jet pip. If your jet pip isn't working and they don't want to go up any more on that, then they can add conventional ventilation breaths with pip and peep and with pip and rate and all that stuff. Um, of course, on your conventional ventilator, if you have an oxygenation issues, the the jet's not going to be able, to, doesn't have those settings, so you just adjust your peep and FiO2 on the the conventional ventilator